Thanks for listening to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. You've probably taken a double take every now and then, seeing someone you think is someone else. But it isn't who you think it is. It's just a doppelganger, someone who resembles someone else. A doppelganger is a biologically unrelated lookalike or double of a living person. Maybe you're in a restaurant or at the mall or on vacation or someplace else, and you lean to the person next to you and say, Hey, doesn't that look like so-and-so? They may be a doppelganger from someone in your family or a coworker, or maybe the doppelganger of a celebrity. But it makes you take a second look, or maybe even stare a bit, wondering, are they or aren't they the person that you think they are? CNN ran a story about doppelgangers a few years back. They talked to two guys in Atlanta who actually know each other, and people always mistake them for each other in public. The article said that the men have looked into it, and they are not related. One man's family came from the Bahamas in the Dominican Republic, while the other's ancestors came from Scotland in Lithuania. The two look so similar, though, that even facial recognition software had a hard time telling them apart from identical twins. Even a study in Spain has looked into doppelgangers. They took 32 people with lookalikes who were part of a photo project of doppelgangers. They asked the pairs to do a DNA test, fill out questionnaires about their lives, even put their images through three different facial recognition programs. Half the group had similar scores to identical twins identified using the same software. And on the genetic level, the article quoted those leading the study with saying that the doppelgangers shared several genetic variants genetic variants that help shape the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the lips, and even the bone structure. These similar codes, though, were just random by chance. The researcher said, In the world right now, there are so many people that eventually the system is producing humans with similar DNA sequences. This has probably always been the case, but now with the internet, it's a lot easier to find doppelgangers. Where we pick up in the book of Acts, Paul is in Jerusalem. He's just pulled away from an angry mob of critics, and due to an assumption that was incorrect about Paul, they pounced on him while he was in the temple. And while they were seeking to kill Paul, the Roman commander plucks him out and whisks him off to take cover in the barracks. But Paul stops on the steps and looks into the crowd gathered there, and he sees many a doppelganger of himself staring back at him. No, they did not physically resemble Paul necessarily, but in that crowd, he could see himself in so many of them. Paul himself, once so zealous for keeping the law of Moses and the traditions, and he too had taken to violence to uphold it until the end. But Jesus had met Paul on that road and shown him the light, and he was a changed man, born again. But looking back on the crowd there on the steps of the barracks, he saw a group of misunderstanding Jews that reminded him so much of himself. And it's to that crowd that he speaks as we pick up in Acts chapter 21. Paul is in Jerusalem, facing a crowd of Jews passionate about the law, and they're causing a ruckus, all based upon an assumption that was not even true. Paul had been warned that hard things awaited him in Jerusalem, and the climate, well, it was ripe for things to ignite. A rumor had spread that Paul taught against the law of Moses, which was a misunderstanding completely. Paul found that the gospel made believers righteous, justified by faith, and that the works of the law could not make anyone more righteous in God's sight, because Jesus paid it all on the cross. And so, as Paul had gone to the temple to fulfill a vow, an intended peacemaking olive branch suggested by the church leaders in Jerusalem, but the Jews had not gotten the memo, and an assumption was made that he had defiled the temple by bringing in a Gentile travel companion, a non-Jew, and instead of smoothing things over, it was a powder keg that went off. We saw last time that Paul had been seized by the crowd, drug out of the temple, the doors were locked behind him, and plans to kill him in the works, and the Roman commander of the garrison and the soldiers run out and get Paul away from the crowd, binding him and the soldiers literally carrying him because the mob was so violent. And that's where we pick up in Acts 21 verses 37 through the first verse of chapter 22. It says, Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? And he replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. It seems there was a lot of misunderstanding in this chaotic uproar that had erupted. The Jews assumed incorrectly that Paul had brought a non-Jew into the temple. The commander thinks maybe Paul is an Egyptian guy who had made the Jerusalem headlines recently when he led a rebellion of 4,000 assassins into the wilderness. 
So when Paul asks, as they're heading up into the barracks to stop and address the crowd, the commander is thrown a bit, wondering, okay, wait a minute, what in the world is going on? Paul speaks Greek, not just Aramaic or Hebrew, the common languages of the people and of the Jews, but because Paul was from a Greek-speaking part of the empire, he knew the language and the culture of both worlds. But now he has the commander's attention, and he wants to speak to the crowd with the permission of the commander, of course. Did you catch that? Here the crowd is mobbing Paul, ready to kill him. He is whisked away by the soldiers, more or less rescued in the scene, about to enter into the barracks to safety, to a protected place. But Paul stops and asks not to go in just yet, but to address the crowd. On the surface, this is a foolish move. He's about to head into safety. He could shake the dust off his feet and leave the mob behind. I mean, this is Paul's moment of liberation. He can be rid of them. The crowd was unjustly accosted him and with ill intent, but Paul doesn't run to safety or leave them because, quote, they're not worth his time. No, he actually asks to address them, not to tell them off or to stick out his tongue as he goes or his fingers in his ears like a younger sibling provoking the big brother trying to beat them up as his mom whisks them off a sort of, ha ha ha, you can't do anything to me now. Paul wants to speak to them. And what does he want to say? You see, rather than looking back at the crowd and being full of rage or anger or feeling like a victim who has a moment to address their attacker at the sentencing for a violent crime to finally put them in their place, Paul stares at that crowd and he sees himself in all of them. He looks at them with all their misplaced zeal and passion for the Old Testament law, with all their self-righteous convictions and traditions they have actually blinded them from the truth of God. Paul sees them and he sees himself, who he once was. He sees them all as his doppelgangers, and Paul has compassion on them. Paul had yearned for years for the chance to speak to the Jews. His heart was overwhelmed with a desire to share with them about Jesus. He told the Romans in chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that they may be saved. And in chapter 9, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul so desired that the Jews would discover that Jesus was their Messiah and that his death on the cross had fulfilled the law, something he had discovered after years of zealously trying to stamp out the name of Jesus. Paul felt so deeply about it, so much compassion for them, wanting to trade places with them if he could, either for a moment so they could just see what he had seen in Jesus or for eternity so they would not miss out on eternity with Jesus. And when Paul saw that crowd, he saw himself, and he saw that this might be his chance. A few things here. Paul gives up his his chance at self-preservation in order for this moment to speak to the crowd. It can cost us to reach others for Christ, to serve them, to love them, to bring the message to them. It would be so much more comfortable and safe and desirable for Paul to head inside. For himself and his own self-preservation, it would be far better. But if this was his chance to share the good news, well, he would give up all that entering that door might have gained him. He would exchange it, even if it cost him, in order to invest in this eternal opportunity to share Jesus with them. The Holy Spirit had filled Paul's heart in such a way that he valued them more than himself in this moment. And if serving Jesus cost him the chance of security— he would gamble it. It's interesting how the value of things might change. We went to a Titanic museum, and one of the highlights was a recreation of the grand staircase of the Titanic. You might have seen a version of the staircase in the 1990s Titanic film if you saw it. The deep, varnished wood staircase with the ornate detailing and impressive flooring. Well, the museum had a recreation, and the attendant gave an interesting tidbit about the staircase. In the original Titanic in 1912, The builders had a choice to do the flooring with linoleum or granite, and of the two, they selected the granite. Why? Because back in 1912, linoleum, well, it was a newer product because it was fabricated. So they actually chose granite because granite was $1.50 cheaper per square foot than linoleum, which back in those days, $1.50 was quite a lot. Well, in the museum recreation, you can guess what they installed, the linoleum because today's granite is much more expensive than linoleum. It's used in higher end furnishing, whereas linoleum is the cheaper grade material. But back in 1912, linoleum held more value. See how the value of things can change? When we decide to follow Jesus, 
Anything with eternity attached to it takes on an eternal value. It becomes more valuable because eternity is attached to it. And while Paul might have taken the option to go into the barrack to save his own hide in that moment, he opted to stop on the stairs and address the crowd because he valued their salvation above his own self-preservation. It's interesting how the value of things might change. Things that once seemed so valuable and important to us may not seem so valuable or important in light of Jesus and the souls of others. How many ministers or missionaries or faithful servants have personally sacrificed so that others might hear? The Sunday school teacher working a full-time job, staying up late Saturday night to prepare a lesson for the kiddos in their class so the next generation might hear about Jesus. Or the overwhelmed parent who would love to sleep in on Sunday but makes it a priority to get the family to church each week to lay a foundation in Jesus. Or the missionary who leaves the comforts of their nation and security it brings to go into a far nation to tell about Jesus, some even risking their lives to do so, as I think of Jim Elliott and the edge of the spear and beyond the gates of splendor. But the Holy Spirit changes the value of things. And if we see that we still hold on to the things of this world all too dear, we can ask the Lord to change our hearts to help us value what He does, the things of eternity more than the things of this earth. So with permission, Paul begins his address, and the crowd falls silent as they hear him speak in Hebrew. The Jews were passionate about their language, and Paul had their attention when they heard him speak in their mother tongue, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. He calls them brethren and fathers. Again, he saw so much of himself in them. They were brothers, shared the same DNA spiritually and nationally with Paul. While the rumors had been that Paul spoke against Moses and the law and that he was more or less anti-Jewish since coming to Jesus, it was not true. They were his brethren, and his zeal and passion for them had increased, a true burden to share with them the hope that he had found in Jesus. It was not just enough that he had been saved, he longed to share it with them as well. He addressed them as fathers, too. He saw the family resemblance when he looked at them, the family resemblance in a spiritual sense, what they believed and stood for, because Paul had stood for the same things. Who has God given you a burden for? Who do you look out and see that reminds you so much of you? Maybe they believe or do the things that you once did, or struggle with the things you once struggled with, or are going through the testing that you once went through. It might be tempting to turn our backs and head someplace safe for us, since we have our salvation after all, but perhaps the Lord has shown us how much they resemble us so that we can speak into their lives and situation from a place of understanding and compassion. I'm so thankful for my wife for many reasons. Marriage is not always easy, but marriage is so blessed. And yet it took many years, it felt, for the Lord to bring me a spouse. Serving on the mission field for 10 years before God brought Aaron into the picture. And it was not easy, I can tell you, those waiting years, as can all those people who helped carry me through that season testify to as well. But now when I meet people who are single or even divorced or even widowed or widowered, I see myself in them so much that I have a real burden for them and heart to encourage them, even if just in prayer, because I'm, I see myself in them and know what it is like to endure long seasons of going solo. Who do you see in the crowd that is your doppelganger? You may not feel overly qualified to speak into their life or situation, or you may not be sure you have anything to say, but they may not need an expert. They may just need someone who understands. Think about it. Even Jesus came and lived this life, experienced all we experienced, yet was without sin, so that when he looks upon us, he sees us with compassion. He is, as Hebrews points out, our compassionate high priest, who can minister to us as well as on our behalf before the Heavenly Father, because he looks on the crowd of humanity and says, I get it. And he just might have imparted part of that heart to you as well, to see yourself in the crowd, so you can speak and act in compassion. Paul has the floor now, and we see what happens in Acts 22, verses 2 through 5. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. So Paul tells them, first, that he sees in them the zeal that he once had for the things of the law. He gets and understands their passion to defend Judaism and the form that they had evolved it into. He called it the strictness of their father's law. Since by Paul's day, the Pharisees had taken 
God had given Moses in the original law, and they interpreted and added to it, adding layer upon layer of interpretation and practice that morphed the whole thing into a system, well, of bondage. It was burdensome. And Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And because he fulfilled it, because we never could, he invited those burdened by trying to seek to be righteous through the law. Jesus invited all those who were weary and heavy laden by the law to come to him. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And they would finally find rest for their souls. And Paul had released the burden of the law and received the light burden of Jesus, yoked together in the righteousness of Jesus. But he tells the crowd that he sees himself in them. He too had been uber zealous for the law. He lists for them all that he did to seek to uphold what he believed to be right, schooled under Gamaliel, teaching the strictness of their father's law. That would be man's interpretation of the law as the Pharisees twisted and turned it. And Paul says that he was zealous toward God as all of them were that day, even persecuting those who did claim that Jesus was the way, just like they're doing. So as he looks in the crowd, he gets why they're being so passionate about stamping out Paul because Paul would have been doing the stamping some 23 years earlier. In fact, he did, as that crowd that day was doing there to Paul. I get it, Paul says. I know exactly what you're thinking and what you're doing. You know, the things we notice in others and often the things that bother us in others or the things we can see others doing and we look at it and can see that they're doing something wrong, oftentimes we are guilty of the same things. But it is easier to spot in others and we can be more critical when others do it. We can justify it in our own behavior or even be blind to it in our own behavior. But when someone else does it, we can jump all over them. King David in the Old Testament had sinned with Bathsheba. He was supposed to be off at war, as was the custom of the kings. But he stayed home that year, perhaps in prosperity and power he felt he could kick back a bit. But rather than engaging with what the Lord had for a king to do in those seasons, David stayed home and saw from the roof one day a beautiful woman bathing whose husband Uriah was away fighting in the war for King David. And David called Bathsheba to his home. She got pregnant by the king, and David sought to cover it up. He brought her husband home from the front lines under the pretense that he wanted him to bring a report from the front lines, hoping the husband would head home to spend some time with his wife before heading back to war. But the soldier never went home, feeling it would be unfair to do so in a time of battle, when his fellow soldiers did not have the luxury of a weekend pass. So instead, once Uriah gets back to the front lines, his plan was failed. He sends a message to his general that puts this husband on the front lines in the heat of a battle, and he is strategically killed in the battle, a passive way and ploy of David to have Bathsheba's husband killed. So then David quickly takes his widow Bathsheba as his wife, so that no one will suspect that the child was conceived before her husband died. We'll fast forward, and Nathan the prophet gets a message from the Lord some months later. David has sinned, and Nathan confronts him, but he does it in a roundabout way. He tells a story of a supposed conflict in the kingdom between between a poor and humble man and a rich man. The poor and humble man, he has one lamb, a lamb that is like a pet, eats with the family, like a child to him. And the rich man, he has all the flocks he needs. And yet he takes that one lamb from the humble to slaughter for a visitor passing through that he is hosting. Nathan the prophet relays this story to David, and David is livid. He sees how injustice is, and he says, This man who has done this shall die and restore fourfold for the lamb for not having pity. David could see how unfair it was in the story of the lamb, which he thought was actually true. But when David reacts and responds, Nathan delivers the punchline. David, you are the man. That selfish act of the rich man taking the one lamb of the poor man, That is wickedness of what you did when you took Uriah's wife. You are the man, David. And David realizes in that moment the weight of it all. He gets the point. But you see, that selfish sin looked so much worse when David saw it on the supposed rich man in the story. He could see in that scenario just how wrong it was when it was projected on someone else. But in his case, he justified it. He ignored it, was even blind to it. It looked much worse on someone else, and the things he was bothered by in someone else were the very things that he was guilty of as well. We can be guilty of the same, seeing things in others that we clearly see are not right, but in reality, we are guilty of the same or even worse. We just cannot or do not see it in ourselves. Jesus saw that same tendency in the Pharisees and addressed it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's not that we are to ignore things that we see in others, but in humility, we have recognized it and confronted it in ourselves first, allowing the perspective of of the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit to bring cleansing and freedom from that which clouds our vision. Paul had been a Pharisee with a plank, but Jesus had opened his blind eyes. And as Paul looks on the crowd, he says, I was just like you. I totally get where you're coming from. You are all my doppelgangers 20 years ago. In this, perhaps, a hope that they might see that if the Lord could change Paul, he might also want to change them. So Paul tells them that it was a moment like this, when he was in the very act of trying to snuff out Christians, as this crowd was currently doing with Paul. It was in a very similar moment in his own life that Jesus met him and changed his perspective. Acts 22, verses 6 through 16, in which Paul recounts his conversion. Now it happened, as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him whom spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, he came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Paul recounts the story of when he was basically caught in the act, implementing a plan to deal with the Christians, to silence them and render them ineffective. And the Lord supernaturally intervened in that situation, and Paul was saved and born again. I wonder in the back of Paul's mind as he is speaking to them at that moment outside the barracks, if he's thinking, okay, Lord, now would be the perfect time. The stage is set just like it was for me right outside of Damascus, as I had ill intent for your people there. We've got all the makings right here for you to do it again. This group is persecuting me. I am the believer this time. And so go, Lord, do it right now. Shine your light. Let's have a group Damascus experience right now. Ready, set, one, two, three, go, Lord. I wonder if that is something Paul was hoping God would do right about then. Just shine the same light again and meet this crowd the same way that he had met Paul on the road all those years ago. How cool that would have been. I sort of picture that old device from the old movie Men in Black. The agents had that neuralizer. It looked like a pen that they clicked and the bright light flashed. They would hold it up in front of the eyes of someone who had an alien sighting. And whoever had seen the aliens would have their minds erased and forget all about what they had seen. Is Paul hoping for a neuralizer moment, a road to Damascus flash in which this crowd that had threatened to kill Paul just moments earlier would, quote, see the light and be born again? Maybe Paul was hoping for a second Pentecost, since he was in town for Pentecost, after all. It was a reason he had rushed to get there, finishing up his missionary journey to be in Jerusalem in time for the feast. Perhaps on the stairs, Paul had that heart hoping for the light to flash and the spirit to pour out, and this whole group of Jewish zealots who were persecuting him would understand salvation and come to Jesus right then and there. We each have our own conversion story, don't we, of how Jesus saved us. We don't all have a road to Damascus moment. We don't all experience a big Pentecost revival meeting or altar call. But no matter how we get saved, we need to be saved. I've shared about a guy who I was sharing with for months on end, and I could tell by our conversations that he was not yet born again. But he watched a TV preacher pretty regularly, so I began to pray for that TV preacher, that God would use him to share the gospel in a way that my friend would understand. Some months later, my friend asked during a conversation that we were having, hey, saying, hey, that preacher I watch, he's been saying a lot lately, when I got saved, when I got saved, what does that mean? Is being saved, is that like baptism or something? What does it mean to be saved? Well, that was the right question, because we all need to get saved. And I shared the faith with him, and he got saved that day. It does not matter how, and God does not always follow a script, but we do need salvation. 
to repent of our sin and rebellion, to acknowledge the cross as God's way to pay our sin debt, to confess the Lord Jesus and believe that he was raised from the dead, offering us forgiveness. We each have a need to repent and be saved. When Paul got saved, God sent a messenger shortly after. Notice again how Paul talks about it. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. God used a messenger, a devout man according to the law, just like many there that day, one who had, quote, a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. The Jews in Damascus approved of Ananias. They had nothing against him. And this Ananias, whose name means the Lord is gracious, he is the one that God used to point Paul to Jesus, to have his sight restored in Jesus' name, and to be baptized into the name of Jesus. It was a faithful Jew who kept the law that ministered to Paul in his first steps as a follower of Jesus. Now, mentioning Ananias here before this crowd, it would be strategic. For the Jews all riled up against Paul that day, they saw Christians like Paul as radicals, renegades, fringe people who needed to be silenced and stopped. But Paul points out that God used a law-abiding Jew to lead him closer to Jesus in his first steps as a baby believer. Paul wants them to see that they are in the wrong in their assumptions and rumors that he is against the law of Moses and the Jewish law and even the traditions they were clinging to so tightly. Paul had no problem with those things, nor did he distance himself from those who did desire to follow the law. But Paul just was free to not seek to be righteous by the law. And Ananias was the vessel that was used to open Paul's eyes. Ananias, whose name means God is gracious. That is the truth that Paul saw firsthand that day outside of Damascus, that God was gracious to him. When Ananias told Paul what to do next, he said, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The washing away of your sins. It would have been a novel concept for Paul as a Pharisee that day he got saved, and would be of curiosity to this crowd listening to him outside of the barracks. The Jews went through their ritual cleansings and their ceremonial sacrifices, and under the law, those things all covered over sins that had been committed but they never took them away completely. I recently repainted our bathrooms, finishing up a repainting of the whole house I did two summers ago, but never got to the bathrooms. In the last couple of months, I had it on my radar that I needed to finish up and do the bathrooms finally. And one reason was there was this trim around the window in one of our bathrooms, and the white trim framing the window was bubbling in one part, sort of the whole length of the trim, it was bubbling up. I wasn't sure why, whether there was water damage or something else, but I knew when I would finally get to repainting it, I would need to sand down that piece of trim and maybe even replace the whole piece once I removed the covering of paint that was bubbling. Well, when I finally got to prepping the room for paint a few weeks back, I went to sand that one board. And the paint came off so easily that I actually just took a paint scraper and I ran it the length of the piece of trim and all those layers of paint, they just came off all the way down to the wood. And what I saw was there was a pretty old layer of paint, not even white. It was beige. It was the original paint color on that piece of wood. And it was no longer bonded to the wood. Maybe some leftover water damage from when I had the window replaced a few years ago. But that paint, it was all peeled off. That bottom layer of beige paint had never been removed way back in the day. And for years, paint had just been applied to it over and over again, just covering it with each new coat. And now I was finally coming and stripping it all away. And it was so easy to do with the might of my paint scraper. It took just a few moments to undo years of layering and covering, which I then thinly primed and painted over. And it it was bright white trim once again, white as snow. Nothing hidden or covered underneath or bubbling up. Just a fresh layer of pure white paint. The Old Testament law was a system of covering over the sins that were committed, redoing the sacrifices time and again, returning to the ceremonial baths time and time again. But then Jesus came and took away the sins of man by paying for it all on the cross. So Ananias asked Paul, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Don't cover them up any longer. If you call on Jesus, they will be washed away, something the law could not do. Paul was hoping that the crowd of Jews listening that day might long to do the same, to stop attempting to cover over sin with good works upon good works, by layering their own layers of righteousness one over another, but instead to finally be washed away from their sins, to have them completely removed.
Paul really wants them to see that the gospel is for people just like them too. Paul himself could see himself in them, and he had come to Jesus. Paul could see Ananias in them, and he had been used by Jesus. Paul hoped they would see themselves in all that he was sharing, that they might conclude, hey, maybe the gospel's for me too, that it was not just for some marginalized group of rebels. Paul now fast forwards his story a bit. He saved in Damascus and baptized, and after some time, he comes to Jerusalem for his first visit post-conversion. Remember, Paul is now saved in this part of the story that he relays, and his passion is he wants to tell the rest of the Jews what he finally saw. He was just itching to give an altar call to the Jews in Jerusalem. And we read Acts 22, 17 through 21. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Paul returned to Jerusalem after his conversion, and he was in the temple, the very temple that they had just drug him out of. See? That proves it again. Paul was not anti-Moses or anti-law. His first trip to Jerusalem post-conversion, and where did he head to pray? To the temple. He wasn't against it. Now, he knew now in Christ he had just as much access to God anywhere else as well, since Jesus had opened the middle wall of separation, but Paul nonetheless had come to that very temple and prayed. And God spoke to Paul there. Paul was in Jerusalem with a desire to preach to the Jews, even there in the temple. He might have been strategizing how to go about it, but Jesus spoke to Paul, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Paul shares this little back and forth he had with the Lord there in the temple. He had come to Jerusalem desiring to preach to the Jews. He was not anti-law or anti-Moses as they were accusing him of. He wanted to share his testimony there with them. But Jesus is the one who told them to get out of town. He told Paul that if he did share, they would not receive his testimony about Jesus. In a second, we will see that they will follow through and kick Paul out. But some 20 years earlier, Paul had thought that then was the time to preach to them. But God said no. And if he had, that would have slammed the door shut. So Paul has waited some 20 years to be able to speak about Jesus to them there in the temple in Jerusalem. But Paul, 20 years earlier, spoke back to Jesus, thought Jesus may not have thought it out well. And Paul said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Paul had told Jesus, look, Jesus, I am the perfect candidate to tell the Jews. I stood in the Place, and surely they will see my, my street cred and listen, right? Oh, we can often plan out our speeches in our heads of what we might say to certain people in situations, the convincing we'll do, the rebuttals we might give, the persuasion we can offer. But sometimes it sounds so much better when we practice in our heads than when the actual conversation goes down. And so Jesus saw that with Paul 20 years earlier. And though Paul seemed like he might be a good choice as a herald to preach Jesus, it was not the time or the season. God God had other things for Paul. We read, Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Jesus would switch Paul's focus to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world. It's where he would focus the next two decades, eventually three missionary journeys. And Paul was faithful in that calling for almost two decades until the Lord opened the door to come back to Jerusalem to share. And Paul believes that moment to be right now. Sometimes we need to wait a long period of time for God to fulfill his plan and timing, for God's call upon our lives to come to fruition, for the Lord to faithfully fulfill what he has promised. The Lord spoke to the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk in chapter 2 of his writing. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Write it down, Habakkuk, because it is going to take a while. And if you don't write it down, you might forget about it, but it's going to come. It will not tarry, though it may feel like it is, but wait for it. It will come in the Lord's perfect timing. For Paul, that perfect timing seems like it comes right now.
But for most of Paul's years in ministry, he was ministering to the Gentiles at the command of the Lord. So if the Jews there that day had rumors that Paul had rejected the law of Moses and was teaching Jews not to keep it, then they actually need to take that up with Jesus because Paul had come to Jerusalem to minister to Jews who were under the law, but it was the Lord's command that sent him to the Gentiles. So if they're allergic to Paul because of his Gentile connections, they need to take that up with Jesus. We can be critical of what God has others doing sometimes, but it is not up to us to judge their ministry that they feel called to. Paul exhorting in Romans 14, 4, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. If God has called someone, they are seeking to be faithful to the Lord. And we do not always know the full picture. Like the woman who anointed the feet of Jesus, she poured out the oil, and the disciples thought it was a waste, critical of something the Lord saw as valuable to him. They had judged what God had put on her heart to do, and they did not have the full picture. Well, here in Acts, they listened until Paul said the word Gentiles, and then they go off. Verses 22 and 23. And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore their clothes off and uh, threw dust into the air, all it took for them was to hear the word Gentiles, and the crowd blocked him out and went off. I remember in Bible college, one of the interns was teaching this passage, and he told an illustration that has always stuck with me. I was in Bible college in the late 90s, and all of us were kids of the 80s, and we had grown up with a show called Pee-wee's Playhouse. Pee-wee was this geeky, nerdy guy with oddball friends, furniture that talked, and he was a grown-up, but just kind of a big kid in the end. And he had on each show a secret word of the day. And he would tell the audience at the top of the show the secret word. And if or when the secret word was spoken during that show, you were supposed to scream, to go off, to jump up and down, a vocal explosion when you heard the secret word. And the show would go on, and at some point or points along the way, some character would say the secret word. Maybe it was the postman or the neighbor lady or some other guest or character. And when they said the secret word, everyone, including the kids watching at home, would scream and chimes would go off, a whole bunch of noise. Well, that was the illustration the intern in Bible college shared with us, and I've never forgotten it. For this Jewish crowd, the word Gentiles was the secret word of the day. And when they heard Paul say it, they went off. They listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. Such a passionate outcry, because they believed the Gentiles were unfit to be saved that they were so far gone that they were only good for fueling the fires of hell. But Paul had seen it out in the mission field. Gentiles had come to faith in Jesus, and Jesus had saved them, the Holy Spirit sealing them and filling them. But this Jewish crowd would have none of it. It was the secret word of the day, and there was no pulling them back in. Paul had lost his audience. Some people just won't listen. They have their mind made up, harden their hearts, close their eyes, and you can try and share with them or reason with them, but they will not be persuaded. Their mind is made up. In such cases, we need to give them over to God because God can crack them open like the tightest oyster in the sea or the vault that is sealed. God can and will continue working on even the hardest heart, and we can only just pray for them. Paul had been just as opposed to the work of Jesus, and he was an example of what Jesus could do in changing a heart, in changing a mind, in changing a life. But this crowd would have none of it. We read what happens next, verses 24 through 29. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under the scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum of uh, money I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. So this whole time that Paul is speaking, the commander is standing by. He and the Greek soldiers are not exactly sure what Paul is saying, because Paul has been speaking in Hebrew. The crowd has been silent. The Jews there outside the barracks have been listening to Paul as he speaks in Hebrew and shares his testimony. But the commander and the centurion the soldiers cannot understand. So when Paul says the secret word of the day, Gentiles, and the crowd erupts, 
the commander springs into action and orders Paul to be brought into the barracks. So now the Roman contingency wants to get to the bottom of this. Who was Paul and what had Paul said that caused the Jews to explode? Remember, it's feast time and the Romans were always on high alert. Constant tensions between the Romans and the Jews. The Jews resentful that Rome was ruling over them. The Romans anxious because the Jews continually spoke of a Messiah of being delivered from Roman rule. So the commander orders a scourging, a process by which they would whip the accused in order to get a confession from them. Believing the physical pain would get even the most tight-lipped accused to tell the truth with the understanding that the beating would stop if they told the Romans what they wanted or needed to hear. Well, it appears Paul is bound for the scourging process to begin, but that Paul then asked the centurion standing nearby, can you really scourge a Roman who is not condemned? The Romans took civil rights very seriously, and as a Roman citizen, you could not be bound or beaten unless you had been condemned by a public hearing. So here Paul is in private, in the garrison, with no witnesses or hearing done, and they're getting ready to beat Paul to get more information. It's totally against the rules. And Paul mentions this. The commander probes a bit, saying that he was a naturalized Roman citizen and that he had purchased his citizenship at a high price. But Paul reveals that he was born a citizen, meaning his dad or another ancestor had been granted it, likely done something admirable, and it was given to them. Or if someone did military service for 25 years and received an honorable discharge, they could obtain it. So this is Paul's get-out-of-jail-free card. What a liberating moment. Paul's citizenship preserved him, saved him in this situation. As Christians, we have been bought at a price by the Lord. No matter what our status on this earth, we are declared citizens of heaven, bought by the blood of Jesus. And God does preserve us from so many things because we are citizens of the kingdom. The blood of Jesus covers us and protects us. And while we live in this world as citizens of God's kingdom, we live under an entire other set of rules. And those rules preserve us in this world, no matter what this world says or determines. That doesn't mean we can just rebel anytime we feel like it. We're told to obey the governing authorities, at least until they contradict God's laws. But God sees those saved under the blood of Christ as part of his kingdom. And just as Paul could not be touched in this situation, how often God declares hands off on us when we get in situations. How comforting to know that we are protected under clauses of the kingdom. We won't always get by without a scratch, but God preserves us when we come under his lordship. No longer just citizens of this world, but citizens of heaven, though we still live on this earth. Now, Paul's trial is not over. It's really just beginning. But God's grace on day one would be a reminder to Paul that the Lord was with him in the trial. As Paul had been told along the way that hard things awaited him in Jerusalem, that he would be bound... But even being bound, Paul would have hope knowing that the Lord had seen this coming and would be with him through it all. And Paul remains bound for a night as we finish in verse 30. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, the commander released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and sat him before them. Paul is set before the head honchos of the Jewish faith, which we'll look at next time. At first, they may sound like this may sound like not a good thing. He's sent to the principal's office, per se. But for Paul, how thrilling. He gets a private audience with this group of gatekeepers and influencers. An open door and, in fact, an invitation to share Jesus with them, to tell them his story. Because Paul sees a room full of doppelgangers. People just like him, or at least who he once had been like, who needed to hear the message of Jesus too. And Paul would have been thrilled to have this captive audience. And all the hard things and adversity that brought this opportunity, well, they were all worth it to him. Lord, as believers, our lives are not our own. Thank you for paying the price, Lord, to purchase us with your blood. And Jesus, as we come under your authority, may we have the boldness to proclaim your name and have opportunities to share our testimonies of what you have done in our lives. Lord Jesus, open our eyes with compassion and mercy and empathy for this world around us, who has yet to know you. And may you orchestrate clear moments in which you would have us proclaim your truth to those who need to hear. God, give us your spirit and all we need to be bold and effective witnesses for your name and prepare even the hardest hearts to hear. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.